I'm Liza Mundy. I'm a journalist here in DC and director at New America of our breadwinning and caregiving program, uh, which is um, in some ways a fancy name for work life, but we named it that way uh, to emphasize that breadwinning and caregiving are responsibilities uh, shared by men and women alike. Uh, as Anne Marie has pointed out, um, at some point in our lives, we will probably all be breadwinners and all be caregivers. We will certainly all need breadwinning and caregiving. And we want to discuss, uh, fashion, and promote policies that will enable people to uh, better achieve both of these uh, signal human responsibilities and pleasures. Uh, we are really fortunate to have with us today um, Latifa Lyles, who is the director of the Women's Bureau at the U.S. Department of Labor. We're very honored and pleased to have her with us. The uh, Women's Bureau was created back in 1920, if I'm correct, um, to promote the, uh, promote the well-being of working women who were mostly at that point in manufacturing and in many cases being paid less than men were um, over the years as women have uh, entered the workforce. I know that the mission has expanded to include work-life balance and child care and working conditions and equal pay. So we can talk about how paternity leave plays into all that. Uh, we have with us Jake Brewer, who is the Managing Director of External Affairs at Change.org, which as you all probably know is a petition website dedicated to empowering people to create social and political change. Uh, it now, it, it has, according to a piece in Fortune, uh, 207 employees in 18 countries. I don't know if that exact number is, yeah, yeah. And, um, and a policy of offering 18 weeks of fully paid parental leave to every employee there. So uh, we'll discuss how, how that came about and how it's working out. And we're really fortunate to have Barbara Wankoff, um, who is the Director of Workplace Solutions at KPMG. So we also have a very large um, employer, uh, provider of professional services and accounting and auditing and all those great things. Um, she has been active in this space for a long time. It's her responsibility to um, help develop and promote work life and flexibility programs at KPMG. And if I'm correct, you all have been offering paternity leave for quite some time. So we can talk about, um, talk about how that came to be and how it's worked out. I guess just two sort of opening, um, without being overly anecdotal, two opening reflections. My exposure to paternity leave came um, 19 years ago when I had my first child, I was working at the Washington Post. We had a good maternity leave policy. We also had a paternity leave policy. And looking back, I, it, it seems kind of surprising. I'm not quite sure why we did. I suspect it had something to do with our guild and um, you know, labor organization. Uh, but nobody took it. No, no man that I knew took it. And, uh, but I remember when I had my first child, I was standing in the lunch line with a male colleague uh, who was also, his wife was about to have a child, and he was going to take it. He was like, because he had been active in the guild, he had been a labor reporter, he was very aware of his rights, and he said, you know, I am going to take this paternity leave and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. And I know the women in the lunch line practically fell over with love and admiration <laughs> for this man. We were like, oh my God, you're the most wonderful person. And I, he is, actually. Um, but it, 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 it always made me wonder, we talk a lot now about stigma and how men don't take paternity leave because they feel stigmatized. And I'm sure there's truth to that, but I've always been a little skeptical because I felt like at least the women in the room felt just, again, full of admiration. Um, uh, and my only other sort of anecdotal thought that we can use to frame our discussion, um, I guess my second introduction to paternity leave came about a year ago when my editor at The Atlantic, we were talking about story ideas, and she said, what about, what about paternity leave? I mean, what is that, what is that for? Um, and, and that was, and I, I, I need to do some reporting to, to, to sort of find out where the thinking was on that. And, and of course, it was everything that we talked about today. It was, um, it was what the Scandinavian countries are doing, actually what uh, Quebec has done in terms of um, creating these daddy days that can only be used by men and encouraging men to take it by essentially reversing stigma. If men, in fact, did feel stigmatized for taking leave, uh, the research shows that when you have these days that you're going to lose, men begin to feel stigmatized if they don't take it. So there's some really interesting sort of behavioral modification work going on among governments. Um, and of course, it, in, in our country now, there are, there are three states that have parent, guaranteed parental leave uh, for 
all citizens, people pay into, um, a, they make a small payroll tax contribution so that any worker, they don't have to belong to a you know, forward thinking web business or a, you know, a, a you know, forward thinking professional services provider. They could be a roofer or a bartender or a construction worker um, and they're entitled to six weeks of leave. And I interviewed a lot of workers in California who had taken it, men who were very glad to have these six weeks, did take it, were helping out, not even helping out, were fully participating in the domestic life of their homes, who had working wives and were very, um, you know, very happy to have this opportunity, even as some of them felt a little guilty because older men they worked with had not had this opportunity. Uh, they were availing themselves of it, they were supported by their male coworkers, but they did feel a little guilt that they had some, something that, that um, older men had not had. So anyway, it, it, was, it was the same research we've been talking about. Uh, the people I interviewed were much like the people in this room. Everybody was on board with it. And then after the piece came out, I, was, uh, I went on a radio station and was talking about you know, what all this great research shows about the importance of maternity, paternity leave. And um, this woman, a woman called in. It was a Philadelphia radio show. And she said, she said this is crazy. I, I run a, a, a small auto repair business in Philadelphia, and we can't lose somebody for six weeks. You know, this would just never work for us. It would, and so it was a useful wake-up call that the business case for paternity leave might be evident to all of us, but it's really not evident to, I think, a lot of business owners. And it's just worth, I think, keeping in mind that the case does still need to be made in, in a larger way. Um, uh, and, and, and I think probably people in this room are more sympathetic to the argument than maybe the American public is. So, uh, but then again, you know, it's been mentioned in the State of the Union address, and so perhaps there is a new momentum um, behind uh, the idea of parental leave and, and particularly paternity leave. So Barbara, could you talk about um, maybe the origins of paternity leave at KPMG are lost, shrouded in the mists of time, because it's been quite some time, but how did it how did it get started at the firm? What, was, there, was there a business case that was made? Was it difficult to get men to, to take it and to sign on to it? So uh, thank you, and thank you for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, KPMG has had paternity leave for a long time, early in the 2000s. I actually didn't um, get a chance to look up whether it was 2002 or 2003, was somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and really, it was part of our whole focus on supporting all of our employees and their work life. There was a new recognition that um, we valued somebody's entire self and that we wanted to uh, provide that support for all our people. We had a generous paid time off policy where people could take time off and a generous um, leave policy for new mothers. But we felt that it was also important to provide that time for new dads to bond with their children. And that, it really was um, two weeks at that point in time to, and it was, it was for bonding. Now, we had a lot of flexibility there in terms of somebody could use it within the first year of their, um, after the birth of child or placement of a child in their home through um, foster care or adoption. But, um, and, and people took it actually. We had a very high uptake very early on. So um, our men, we, you know, all of our people work very hard and this is a milestone event in their life and I think they recognize that, wow, the firm is giving me permission to step out a little bit and to spend that time with that new child. So we really did have an uptake. Um, we've had some evolution over time, which I can talk about, but we can um, get to that. Okay, okay. Well, I think that's so interesting that you said that people started taking it right away because I, I recently happened to be chatting with a woman who's a highly placed executive at Twitter, which is you know one of the um, Silicon Valley companies that very publicly offers you know great parental leave, and she was talking about how much trouble they have getting men to take it, and and that this was a frustration for her. So, I, I, Jake, I'll ask you: in your organization, is it hard to get men to take it? Or? That's a great question. Um, so I beyond working at Change Order representing them. I'm also the father of an 18-month-old, and this has been interesting in my own life, so it's kind of living this along the way. So far, uh, we introduced this policy in October, I believe, and now it also grown a lot in that amount of time. Interestingly, the, the only people to take it so far have been men, um, because we, frankly, just women and our staff has not gotten pregnant yet, 
uh, or had their children yet. And so we actually have a couple of expecting mothers, but haven't had you know, women who have taken advantage of it. And what's fantastic uh, is two things. One is two relatively recent hires um, you know, had been hired, I think, within two months. Their, their spouses, their partners had a child. And so they almost immediately after starting then basically took their leave and it's been great and in fact the uh, the culture has been such that it's almost hard to come back not because you don't want to in fact i have this problem which is an interesting thing just to discuss as a as an entrepreneur you know you're kind of excited about work if you're really passionate about your job um, my colleagues basically tried to prevent me from returning to work early uh, which I thought was kind of wonderful and amazing and also like really hard and, and they I wouldn't say they prevent me It was more like they were just encouraging me like hey stay away like we got this it's all good go take go be with your family go take care of your daughter and I, that was like a it was a challenge almost even when you think you're quite progressive in your own views of your own ego kind of stands in your way there um, that's been really exciting to watch and and I think what's also interesting you know our uh, we have 18 offices around the world three of them in the United States and those are in New York Washington DC and in San Francisco you could not pick three more expensive cities to do much of anything much less raise a child and so child care uh, in these cities is ridiculously expensive I can attest to anybody who is not trying to do that with young children so finding a nanny finding a daycare whatever you got to do and with uh, the, the policy by the way is not just parental it's all partners so partners of a birth parent so um, what's interesting is that often the the birth parent will have, let's say, 12 weeks of their own in their own company. In our case, they would have 18, um, but pretty well guaranteed. Most of the time, they're going to have 12. Uh, our head of global HR um, has just recently had a child. He's taken four weeks off and just came back. And what he's going to do is actually take another about probably eight weeks off after his wife's leave expires. And what that does, beyond just obviously extending the time that a parent is full time at home, it actually gives them a lot longer time to find adequate daycare. Right. Um, right. That is, I'll just say, it is hard. <laughs> it's hard to, to right. get into a daycare, to find the right nanny that you trust, or a family situation, or whatever your situation is. It is a very difficult thing, and also just a very emotional thing. So, so extending that time beyond even the four months, which is a lot, or 18 weeks, which is beyond four months, um, to even close to six months, uh, we're seeing is a really powerful um, just for our families and supporting our staff, but also just a strong business thing. We're, we're, we've gotten, since our investment, which we just got uh, in December, which was very values aligned, and this policy, which is in October, uh, the number of applicants to our company has doubled and stayed, actually quadrupled, and then it's come back down and settled at, at 2x, uh, what it was before that, and that is including uh, an extraordinary number of women engineers in particular, uh, which is fantastic. Right now we've got uh, 260 staff. We've grown a little bit. 51% um, are women globally, but just under 50% of our leadership team are women, and the number of women engineers now is also climbing dramatically, where it's not anywhere we'd like it to be, but it is one of the leading in Silicon Valley. So you're starting to see all of this have an impact, not just in the quality of life for staff, but also in the just great business uh, of both getting great investors and getting great staff. So you uh, speak, it seems to me, to the power of stigma. I mean, in, in working environments where people work very hard and love their jobs and want to come back, fortunately, your coworkers stigmatized you so that, um, you know, in the sense that, yeah. no, don't come back. You need to, this is your role right now, and you need to stay there. And, uh, uh, or peer pressure or, or yeah. something. Um, Wonderful experience. So Latifa Lyles, your bailiwick at the Department of Labor is women and their working conditions and equal pay and work-life balance. And so it's women, women, women. On your policy wish list, you know, where does paternity leave fit in? Is that an argument that you would make for the well-being of, you know, of, of the women you, whose, whose sort of work lives you think about all the time? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the very exciting things right now is, as you mentioned, uh, the White House announcing some efforts on at least increasing uh, paid leave for federal workers. And um, another personal anecdote is that uh, my husband and I have a three-year-old split our leave as well. And so I took off two months, he, 
three months, he took off three months, and it extended the time that we had to figure out childcare, which was a very, very major concern. And one of the things I thought was an interesting transition in that story that you told is there's a lot of conversation both in the childcare and paid leave discussion about the outcomes for children um, and how the outcomes for children, we talked about bonding and early early uh, connection and the number of words even that a child hears from a parent makes a difference. But there are also some health outcomes very specific to women. And this is in my own personal experience, just having that level of uh, trust that my child was at home and not in a childcare center was one major thing. But there are very, very distinct reports that show uh, where there are, where women are able to stay uh, at home, take leave, or at least have their child uh, with another parent, uh, whether it's a partner or a, or, or a husband, uh, their likelihood of of depression, postpartum depression, and other uh, emotional issues is dramatically reduced based on the ch both the childcare situation, but mostly the leave in the beginning. And so, from our perspective, um, there are so many benefits to women if more people are taking leave, more men are taking leave. But there are some really practical uh, realities about what that means. You know, one of the things I think is so interesting in this conversation is this this cultural piece is not just, you know, how do we change the culture for men to take leave? We know that when men take leave that the culture of the organization tends to have um, a more positive outlook as it relates to paid leave, which of course affects everyone and women. Also, um, we know that the, the people who are most likely to have leave in their companies are high-level executives, the majority of, of whom are men. And if we really are going to you know, try to leverage the business community, even when there are policies that are not being taken, we know it's going to have to become, you know, it's not 90% you know, of women in the C-suites. It's going to be men utilizing the policies that some very progressive companies have to sort of have maybe even a trickle-down effect, because we know that um, in our surveys, uh, the likelihood of you, you taking leave has a lot to do with your salary and your income. And we know that you know, men make more money. They're more likely to actually have policies uh, that relate to family leave, where they can take paternity leave in that case. So that it's not, it's even, it's even you know, um, if you just look at a sort of an access issue, we know that in some cir circles men have more access. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece I think is interesting um, that we see in our time use survey that we do through the Bureau of Labor Statistics is that when you look at the reasons why men and women take leave or don't take leave. Um, so when it comes to financial reasons and other things, women and men, um, there's, a dis there's a disconnect, but it's not so dramatic. Where it's most dramatic is in men deciding that they can't take leave because of time. So that while if it's because they're worried about losing their job or because they can't afford it, the differential is like two or three points for men and women. But if you ask them, is this reason you're not taking leave because you don't have enough time or you're overworked, it's a dramatic difference. It's 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 23 for I think it's 23 for women and 33 for men. And so they're more likely to say that I can't take it not because I don't have it or I'm worried about losing my job, but I'm just too worked. I'm too overworked and I'm too stressed out. Um, so I think that again, it go, it, uh, there's a from from our perspective, it's a win-win-win <laughs> for everyone, not just the children, but also the women themselves, both in, both in that from a health perspective, but then also in terms of their ability to. Um, maintain their their jobs, and then the other piece that we talk about a little bit is the work, the the labor force participation conversation. And of course, there's a major intersection between childcare and paid leave, and women's ability to retain their job at the same place that they worked before their child was born. Um, but those intersections are extremely strong and critical, and there is, you know, a, a constant leaking of women. Uh, of childbearing age out of the labor force. And this has been studied to have a very, very significant impact on the economy overall. There are even um, estimates that show that if we were able to change the number of women leaving the labor force in those years, we could actually see a bottom line GDP positive effect. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, from our perspective, you know, how women, it's not just if they can take time off and go leave or not leave, it's really a much broader impact on their careers as well um, and their wages. I should have said, this is a conversation. So if at any point anybody says anything that makes you want to chime in, please just chime in. Um, it, 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 your, what you said reminded me of an anecdote that emerged when I was doing my reporting. I interviewed in California a firefighter who was going to take his uh, 
his his paternity leave and was very happy about it. And when I said, you know, that the the question that uh, that Dan Coy's mentioned, like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do during your leave? And it is so hard for any of us to remember what we did during our leave. But uh, but because it hadn't happened yet, he could say, here's what I'm gonna do. My wife is gonna take her leave first. She's a teacher. I'm gonna take a little bit at the beginning to help take care of her and get everything straight. Then she's gonna take her leave. Then I'm gonna take my leave. And I'm gonna use this to get our household on a, compl on, a, on, a on the right schedule. So I'll have dinner made so when she gets, again, I just, I love this guy. She said, he said, you know, I'm going to get have dinner made so that she's not exhausted when she comes home at the end because it's going to be hard for her to go back. Um, but I'm going to ease that transition by having dinner made and then figure out the schedule that will enable all of us as a family and a household to make it work going forward. I mean, what a great guy, right? Um, uh, but it did seem an example of what you're saying, the way that it, it was going to... I don't. I wouldn't say enable his wife to stay in the workforce because you know maybe she would have anyway, or maybe she would have had to anyway. But it's at least going to make it easier for her to stay in the workforce. The, the last thing I wanted to add to your comment about the states is one of the things that we're doing specifically at the Women's Bureau is funding. Um, we have a grant that were released last year, and we're doing another round of a million dollars this year to states to look at feasibility. Uh, both in terms of funding structures and other metrics that uh, a lot of states are in the, po in the in municipalities, cities as well, not just states. Yes, there are three states, but what do we know about those states? And I think some of the um, information that we've learned from California and New Jersey in particular show that from a business perspective, it's a kind of a, a no, there's no story there. I mean, nothing dramatically bad happened. Right. Right. Um, right. Everyone kept working. They coped. They coped. Uh, everyone Six weeks coped. Goes by very quickly. Yes, but on the paternity leave conversation, I know for California in particular, the numbers of men who took advantage of the paternity leave, of the mater of the leave um, in that in instance was really high, and I think we don't tell the stories enough about what's working both in the private sector, but then also in these states. And so part of our goal is to have these conversations around the country so that both, of course, the private sector can learn from each other, which we've been doing with the White House, but also what can states do to move the ball forward? In some cases, it's education. In some cases, it's research. In some cases, it's you know, t you know, feasibility testing or very, very, um, very, very specific economic questions. But I think what we're what we're what we're, be we're able to say in the three examples that we have is that this is really and that you know, having the UK model and we have some conversations with Scandinavian countries as well is that for so many people who have these programs, it's such a non-issue. And I think that this idea that, you know, both for the company and the workers, this is just something that we do because it makes the right, it's the right thing to do. And I think we often focus on the business case or the health case or really um, there are so many different reasons. And generally speaking, in this country, um, most men and women believe it's a good idea. I mean, the, 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 the surveys are off the charts uh, that, that, that no one is really uh, opposed to these concepts. So from our perspective, it moves uh, the ball forward. We do, and I appreciate your comment too about um, why while I do appreciate the, the, the paradigm at home has to change somewhat, um, you know, there's this conversation about shared responsibilities, and we're very realistic about childcare and who's, you know, men are have definitely are doing more dishes and taking care of kids more, more but it is, it is still central um, for, for women and working women because the vast majority of childcare um, and parental care is coming from, from women. I mean, uh, uh, I would agree. I think that the paternity leave is going to have big payoffs to help women stay in the work, workforce. And that's very important to us. I mean, we are really um, believe that the diversity and the um, mix of genders as well as ethnicities is really critical to our business success going forward. So we are always looking at how to keep um, our women in the workplace. And we do have that leaky pipeline, um, especially as people get ready to start families. Do they see the role models of people who are successfully managing dual career households with children? Um, you know, many of our partners have, have uh, female partners have husbands who may have opted out of the workplace or op opted out of a um, demanding career. And so we're, we're always looking at that issue. And we We've looked at the studies that talk about the importance of, of fathers bonding with their children and being that primary caregiver, and um, the, that the women and the mothers need to believe in the competence of their men. And you know, I I I I, I chuckle at this a little bit because our 
women who are you know, well-educated, very competent, um, have married competent men. And they're competent in every scope of their lives, you know, except um, at home or except in caring for that child. So they have to um, recognize that in themselves and empower their husbands, who are very, very able, um, to, to take on that role. And that is going to be critical in the shared, re in the shared responsibilities and then um, both having fulfilling careers and, and staying with it. Per personal anecdote, actually, just I think this is an interesting part of the leave question. Uh, my wife is a, a very extraordinary writer, media person, and, and businesswoman, and travels for work in the same way that I travel for work. And so leaving a young child with your partner is a, is a challenge, I think, for any birth parent. But that competence question is just such an interesting first time happening thing to kind of go through as a couple. And so we you know, dealt with it. And, uh, you know, after about six months or so, my wife would go on a business trip, and it was fine for, for her to leave it. And it was amazing. I mean, not, not at all to toot my own horn. I just found it baffling how few other women that she would speak with found it impossible to leave their child with their husband. And I just found that one tragic. Right. And, and kind of just baffling that that's the culture that we've perpetuated in that way. I, I really quickly, I want to go back to something that, uh, that you were saying about just kind of the, the right thing to do. When we talk about this, uh, we often get asked the economic question first. What's the business case for doing this? And really looking back, I, I was talking to Anne Marie earlier. It, it was in June, she gave a speech at the Personal Democracy Forum, and we were all kind of there together. And we, you know, been milling about what does it just look like to lead and live the values uh, that you espouse as a company. What does that look like? We're a public benefit corporation. Uh, that means we like revenue just like every other corporation to grow. It also means that it's not the reason we have a company. The reason we have a company is to help empower people around the world. That also means empowering our own staff and recruiting and retaining the best possible people to do that. And we just kind of said, well, what would the right thing to do here be? And it was a fully equitable policy uh, that could lead not just for our own company, but kind of to show that it's possible. Um, so when people compare this policy that we have as a 250 person company, the valuation, not huge. We, you know, we're, we are good size, but we're not huge. Uh, it, Facebook, Google, and Yahoo are the three companies that most often get compared to. And those are over 100, well, maybe not Yahoo, but uh, that's a Silicon Valley joke. Um, Google and Facebook uh, certainly have valuations over $100 billion. I'll just say this. We are less than a billion dollar valuation company. And to have, to, to have this kind of policy with a company of that size, just to be able to demonstrate that this can be done, you don't have to be huge and be a very wealthy company. You don't have to have shareholders you know, pouring money in, and you don't have to have investors putting hundreds of millions of dollars in to just make this decision and just decide to do it. We also work, and I just frankly to challenge this city in this room, we also work with tons of advocacy groups who are pushing Washington to pass policies, to pass cities and states to pass policies, or push them to do this when they haven't actually done it themselves as organizations. You can just do it. <laughs> like you can just make the decision and just do it for your staff. Uh, and so to be pushing on that as a policy initiative for others to decide around when you haven't made the decision yourself, I think is just frankly, wrong <laughs> and hypocritical. So uh, you know, uh, when you kind of go back to the reasons behind it, sometimes just the right thing to do should just be good enough. Mm -hmm. Barbara, do you have any sense of, of companies? I'm, I'm, I'm still sort of intrigued by the fact that you all's take up rate was so high so quickly. And given that, that some other companies, um, even those that have very high profile paternity leave policies, do have trouble getting men to take it, do you have any insight into why that would be, why it still, it still can be hard when it's, when it's offered, when it's offered on a silver platter, uh, why there still uh, can be low take-up rates? Yeah, and I think that um, it speaks to our culture. As we are constantly communicating that support for work life and for um, parity amongst genders. So mm -hmm. we're um, encouraging all our people to take their time off to recharge and re-energize by spending time with their family. Um, so in, in, in paternity leave, and we really call it parental leave because yeah, it applies right, yeah. for both, um, it, you know, is not 
the only thing, and it doesn't sit in a vacuum by itself. So we close down between Christmas and New Year's, um, and we, we you basically need you know almost the chairman's permission to work over that time. Obviously, there's a few um, critical services that might by, might um, need to happen during that period, but um, we we want people to take time off, and uh, we need to frankly give them permission. This general generous um, paid time off policy, um, some people use all of it, some people don't and uh, end up losing it. But we're watching those people and we're reminding them that you've got time and we talk to their performance managers to say, hey, what's going on? This person's in jeopardy of losing time, whether it's their, their paid time off policy, their vacation time, or their parental leave, and say, are, you know, why are you scheduling them on these jobs that are not enabling them to take the time that we say is really important to refresh and to keep them fresh and keep them engaged? I mean, this is the, a career at KPMG, you know, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. But to be in a marathon, you need those rest periods and you need rest. I would think that the Silicon Valley companies would be sending that message also. But uh, I mean, is it your impression that? I think my my experience of companies so far is a lot of them will just kind of say like yeah this is really smart we're competing for the top talent you know in the highest uh, you know often high paid jobs uh, and that is just kind of an assumption that you have to go do this now and I think with the the comparison that's frustrating frankly is that it like you have to be a tech company to do this like that that's just a silly silly idea um, you know the I, if you kind of go way, way back, I think it was like basically the mid 40s, mid 50s, you started to look at companies like, you know, the, the GMs and you go forward a little bit and you start to see IBMs and Xeroxes started to think about a lot of these types of things. And those companies are not in this conversation at all. The right. big, large, you know, GEs of the world and how that applies and how we're thinking about them. So, yeah, I guess if for lack of a better term, if you're of a certain size in Silicon Valley, um, we're, we like to think we're a global company, not a tech company or right. a Silicon Valley company. Right. Um, and there's a problem here that we've kind of said, well, those, those outliers uh, out there in San Francisco uh, or Palo Alto or wherever are kind of doing this, and that's maybe a model, but, but this can be applicable anywhere. It can be agencies, yeah, it can be anything of any size. We're competing for talent. Yeah. So um, we, one, need to look at our competitors, and we need to look at anywhere that uh, our talent is going when they, when they leave us. So. But, but also in attracting that talent, and that this is a great place to work because uh, people are looking for that now. One of the things I would say too about, you know, we had a White House Summit on Working Families last year, and you know, part of the, my boss, Secretary Perez, has been, you know, not only talking to different countries on this issue, but also to businesses of all sizes. And one of the, thing that, one of the things that has been v remarkable to me, especially looking at the three states, the history of those states and even campaigns that haven't been successful is the number of small businesses that are the staunchest advocates and um, getting any of these policies changed. And the other piece of it for me is these are the same folks who are having conversations about minimum wage because they pay way be beyond the minimum wage. These are companies that have wage transparency. I mean, there's more of a conversation with, you know, what does it mean to be uh, a responsible, there's a sustainable piece to it. So a lot of the, the companies who have, a, you know, are very concerned with their carbon footprint are also at the table for these conversations. So this. What we find often when we're talking to small businesses and the ones who are very competitive is this broader culture and broader business uh, philosophy that goes beyond this issue but talks about a myriad, as you said, of, of, of policies, whether it's pay and benefits, um, their community presence. And I think that is really, I think, sort of like the beacon. It's sort of like what does it mean to be a model uh, business or employer today. And I think a lot of these things come together. Um, and certainly the impact it has on workers um, is, is much more scalable when you think of these policies together. But I think it's how we uh, talk about the value of work and our workers in general that we have found where there is the most ardent uh, support for these programs is where companies are talking about thinking of their workers as people and not objects, thinking of their workers um, as part of their culture and their decision making even in some cases. So I'm sorry, are you saying that California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, the three states that have 
per paid parental leave laws for everybody, and that includes you know bartenders, gig economy workers, I mean self-employed people. They can all avail themselves. That those states, part of the reasons that they were able to pass that is because they have businesses in those states that are sort of more. Well, in general, I mean Rhode Island is more recent uh, for sure, but I think a lot of the case making and the surveys of businesses of all sizes. You've seen a lot of small businesses coming forward, not just to say I have it, to actually be talking about it from an advocacy perspective. And so that we're seeing more advocacy among small businesses, not just saying we have the policy, but here's why we're doing it. And here's how it fits into our broader corporate, corporate culture um, at a time where you know it's difficult in this economy for, for small businesses, that we hear that all the time. And I think that you know we tend to have these conversations to large audiences. So it's business people and advocates and lawmakers together. And oftentimes, uh, we have just as many, if not more, small businesses at the table as we do these larger companies. And so I think often that is lost in the conversation. Um, and we've got some great examples that, we, that, we, that we've seen in New Jersey and Rhode Island that say, here's what I was doing before the law changed, here's what I'm doing now, and you know, you know, this is working for me and nothing horrible has happened. And in fact, it's better for my company and my workers. Okay. I can attract people, I can keep them here. Um, and you know, I, I just think that the, the size of the company, to your point, I, I, you know, there's so many sort of you know, myths and, and ideas about you know, this can only work for certain groups of people, which is in part uh, why the conversations that need to be industry to industry is so important as well that we've tried to spark is to say, you know, states this is how I'm doing it. I'm a state, I'm a large company, I'm a small company, but here's how I can do it. And I think that talking to businesses for, from where they are um, tends to be very effective. It just seemed to me that also that one important thing about these laws is that it's not just parental leave, right? It's leave to take care of your elderly parents or to take care, in some cases, of your siblings. And when I, again, when I think about the woman who owned the auto body shop who just thought, you know, we, I, I can't afford this, it's so important for people to understand that, uh, that it, it's a benefit to them too personally. They, because so many of our conversations, like around, for example, like uh, contraceptive coverage and insurance. Are they, people will say, well, I'm not a parent. I don't need this. And so I think a lot of people, again, with these paid leave, parental leave laws, think, well, I'm not a parent right now. I don't need this. I don't really care. And part of it is getting out the message, yeah, you might be, not be a parent, but you might have aging parents. You might be an aging parent. So these laws are not just for parents, right? They're for caregiving of an extended group of family members. One thing that keeps, I guess, a question I almost have, or just kind of a thought, is that it does seem like a small and medium-sized business is just simply closer to the lives of their employees. Mm -hmm. And so the full family actually comes to bear more often in the course of just everyday work. Yeah. So whether it's the fact that you are taking care of an elderly parent or a young child, it's just going to be more likely to a conversation that's going to unfold. And it does seem to me that the large drivers of employment are mostly large companies. And the further away that those policy kind of teams are in those companies uh, from their staff, the more that we've started to treat family or parental experience as is more like we treat a hobby, like versus an actual part of yeah. civic fabric, right? It's, it's, it's as though we put policies in place like, oh, that's something you do in your own spare time. Versus this is a fundamental component of a, of a staff person, of a, of a team member, who we want to support in all the facets of their life, which is much more likely, it seems like, mm -hmm. to be coming from people who are much more connected to their employees in smaller and medium-sized things. I don't know if that's true or not. I'd love to see studies on it. But I keep seeing that. It feels like that's something interesting to interrogate more. I should say, are there, are there questions or comments from the audience? We have one in the back. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what you folk think of the uh, reverse paradigm of the traditional one, where we see increasingly, although it's still a minority, of stay-at-home dads full-time and full-time working mothers. Um, do you think that this is uh, as problematic as the traditional reverse paradigm? I think either are problematic if that's what you want. You know, I, I think the, uh, sorry, I, yeah, I don't think either are problematic if that's what you want. I think the problem where, where it starts to become problematic is when there starts to be an expectation culturally or from a policy perspective that that's what you're supposed to do and you're kind of driven in that particular way. So if, for instance, 
men were starting to be driven or feel the pressure to go out of the workforce because policies became so negative, that would be a problem. But until that point, I think it's mostly just like if that's the choice of your family, then great. You know, there's a, the Council on Economic Advisors at the White House during this event last summer on fatherhood that was referenced earlier in the program. Um, there was a chart that showed the report that men and women had um, reporting out work-life conflict. And I couldn't tell you exactly how that's defined. But the, the, one of the stark uh, findings of that report is that men showed work-life conflict at a much higher rate than women. And I think, you know, looking into what that means, it's not because men are taking vastly larger numbers, uh, amounts of leave or, or child care, but I think it's sort of a scratching at the surface about on how this, you know, I think in the problem, the problem area, I would say, is, you know, a backlash, you know, that, that workers may see in the workplace or men may see in the workplace when they're trying to take advantage of these programs or this expectation that, you know, really if I want to do this, I can't do this, um, which of course is, you know, part of what I think people are saying. And so while we see a lot of, you know, r reports about more caregiving and, and time at home, it's really hard to say how many men are, you know, are having a very, very difficult time balancing or working out the conflict, um, you know, in, even if they're not taking leave. And I think that there's more to the cultural piece of the societal, uh, the social science piece of this that I think will uh, be really critical in showing any dramatic change in the way the, the caregiving is done at home. Yeah, I, I love your question because it's something that I've actually thought about um, a, a fair amount. And I think that it's a very personal decision for every individual and every, every family to make. And frankly, there's no one right answer. But I do um, worry that we shouldn't create policies that force men out of the workforce. And then uh, some several generations later, we are faced with the exact reciprocal problem of how do we get men back into the workforce. I think today's model requires uh, dual income families. And we have to figure out a way to um, have people be successful both at home and at work in dual career families. It's a necessity, it's an economic necessity, and frankly, it's a workforce necessity. We need those qualified workers, both genders, both, both, both parties in a family. So um, it, it's, a, it's a personal choice, but I think we have to, from a, from a macro standpoint, be careful in terms of how we position policies. And I agree too that, you know, at the end of the day, the uh, two thirds of households have two parents working. It's not, um, and I, that number is only increasing. And so I think that the, re the, the reality of both parents needing or wanting to work is gonna become more and more the norm. And I think it's, you know, how we reconcile that reality, which is of course what we're struggling with today because a lot of the policies don't account for that change over the past several decades. Last question. Yes, I just wanted to, to say something back on that question. I think it's a kind of I think it's a kind of media fest. I think that the data they can when they talk about this huge rise in the number of home dads, which they do, um, it's uh, they're often mixing in the data on separated fathers who are single. single. You know, it, so I think it isn't a huge increase. Secondly, um, to say that we know from the research there is quite a lot of research on these home dads. And certainly the rate, uh, relationship breakdown rates are higher when the father is a, a home dad. Um, however, when you think about the pathways into being a home dad, um, they're very complex. So where the mother and father have this agreement and it's all worked out, they don't have higher breakdown rates. Where there's a high level of disability among the men who become home dads, you know, there's one down my street, he's blind. He became the home dad, right? So there's stuff around health that will also contribute to um, difficulties in these families and also economics because uh, it, you know, sometimes they're poorer families because there isn't a good male wage in there. So that's all complex and I think that, uh, but I think I, I totally agree with you that what one is saying in the end, there aren't going to be many home dads out of the workforce for years and years and years. There aren't going to be many home mums out of the workforce for years and years and years. You know, this is a temporary situation that families will work out for themselves. And we do want both parents competent at home with care and both parents competent with earning. That reduces the vulnerabilities that their children will face.
And we want to have the supports in place so that people are making tr truly making choices yeah. about whether someone actually wants to stay at home. But if you're staying home because you can't find affordable child care, then it's not a real choice. So I think on that note, um, th those are our panels. We are actually not behind time, although it may look like we are, because unfortunately, uh, the case study from the one Promundo representative, she couldn't get here. So I think Gary's going to make concluding remarks, and we actually are on schedule. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you. So much fun. Great to meet you.